All right, so we are on to section 5.2, and this is going to be probability with addition rules and complements. So we're going to talk about addition rule for disjoint events. We will then talk about the general addition rule, and then lastly, we will talk about the complement rule. So the thing with probability is we have a lot of different rules depending on what type of question we are looking at. We're gonna start with disjoint events. So two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. Another name for disjoint events is mutually exclusive. Okay, so I'm gonna give you an example here. We can draw pictures like Venn diagrams to help us here. These pictures represent events as circles and enclosed in a rectangle. The rectangle is the entire sample space and then each circle is a designated event. So for example, suppose we have randomly, randomly select a chip from a bag where each chip in the bag is labeled with the numbers zero through nine. Let E represent the event, choose a number less than or equal to two. So E is the numbers less than or equal to two, which are zero, one, and two. Event F, choose a number greater than or equal to eight, so eight and nine. The other events, three, four, five, six, and seven, are outside of the circles, but still inside of the sample space. Okay, these events are disjoint because there is no overlap. This event is uh, completely separate from this event here. The outcomes are totally different. So what we can do is calculate the probability of each event occurring. So event E has three of our 10 possible numbers. Event F has two of the 10 possible numbers. So then the probability that I select a number in E or F is just their sum, five out of 10. Next slide explains it a little bit more here. At disjoint events, if E and F are disjoint or mutually exclusive, then the events for probability of E or F occurring is the probability of E added to the probability of F. So take a look here. Probability of E was 0.3, probability of F was 0.2, and the probability of E or F is their sum, 5 out of 10. The addition rule is used when we have the word or. So what's going to happen here is I am only doing one trial. So I'm taking one, uh, what is this? I'm taking one chip out, but I have multiple options that that one chip could be. That one chip could be a number less than or equal to two, so less than or equal to two, or greater than or equal to eight. So I'm only doing one task, one draw, but I can pick from this or this. That is an addition rule. Keyword will be or. There's the probability form. Addition rule for disjoint events can be extended, of course, to more than two. I can include any number of disjoint events. As long as they are disjoint, I can just sum their probabilities together, however many events it is that I am looking at. I'll give another example here. E is still zero, one, and two. F is still eight and nine, but we have added the event G five and six. 
So now I can find the probability of E or I should move this because I'm gonna put there in just a second. So probability of E or F or D. That's what we're going for now. Same set of 10 numbers, the probability of E is still three out of 10. Probability of F is still two out of 10, 0.2. And G, probability of G is gonna be two out of 10, 0.2. Add them all together. Two plus two plus three is seven out of the 10 numbers. Add them together, seven out of the 10. Give me there. Makes sense. Because here's our remaining three. And if I add them all together, I get my whole one, which means I have that probability model. Our number system consists of the digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Because we do not write numbers like 12 as 0, 1, 2, the first significant digit in any number must be 1 through 9. You cannot have a number that starts with zero, okay? So what we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at what numbers, the first number that can happen when you write a number. We may think that each digit appears with the exact same frequency. So that each digit has a one ninth probability of being the first digit. But it is actually not true. In 1881, Simon Newcomb discovered that the digits do not occur with equal frequency. Then the physicist Frank Benford discovered the same result in 1938. So after he studied lots and lots of data, he was able to come up with this data table. The probability model is now known as Benford's Law and plays a major role in identifying fraudulent data on tax returns and accounting books. What actually happens is the probability of starting a number with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or nine is actually not all equal. And we have this law called Benford's Law to determine the actual probabilities here. In fact, have a probability Let's model. Let's verify that we do, in fact, have a probability <laughs> model. All right, well, if I go back well, if here, I go remember back our here, two remember rules of probability is that all the probability values, 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 are, values themselves, are themselves uh, between zero and one. And that is true. All of these values are between zero and one. And I will verify here with you that we do have a sum. Uh, 0.301 plus 0.176 plus 0.125, oops, 0.25, plus 0.097 plus 0.079 plus 0.067, 0.058, 0.051, 0.052, 0.053, 0.054, 0.055, 0.056, 0.057, 0.058, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059, 0.059
And that's what the book here says. If we looked at 100 numbers, we would expect about 48 to begin with a one or two. Use Benford's law to determine the probability that a randomly selected first digit is at least six. So at least means I start with six, start with seven, eight, or nine. So what I'm going to do is find all the individual probabilities and add them together. The probability of six, according to our table, is 0.067. The probability of seven is 0 0.058. The probability of eight, 0.051. The probability of nine is 0.046. Summing all of those together gives me a probability of 0.222 or about 22 out of 100 or 222 out of 1,000, however you want to interpret that. And keep working with disjoint events here. Another thing we can work with is a deck of cards. Here we have anytime, anytime we work with these, I always kind of show the image here because not everybody grew up playing with cards. Okay. I did. I grew up playing with cards and I could tell you all the cards, probabilities. I could tell you all that because to me, cards are something I'm familiar with. But it isn't true for everybody. So sometimes we have to put the visual here just so that you can look at them. So the first probability we're going to calculate here is the probability that you draw a king. All right, so in order to do anything here, you have to know that a standard deck of cards has 52 cards. We want to find the probability that I get a king. Probability of king, well, there are one, two, three, four kings out of 52, and that reduces to one out of 13. You could also do the, the decimal if you wanted to. For this example, we kept it as fractions. So just know fractions, decimals are both representative of probabilities. Second question, so I know I'm not showing the questions right here. I will, they are here. Compute the probability of drawing a king. So we have 52 cards. A standard deck has four kings. So therefore the probability of king is four out of 52 or one out of 13. Next question we're going to do, find the probability of drawing a king or drawing a queen or drawing a deck. So I like to stay on this screen here because it makes a little bit more sense. So king is four out of 52. Uh, queen is also four out of 52. There's four queens. And jacks are also four out of 52. So the probability that I pick a jack, a queen, or a king is all of these added together. Four plus four plus four, 12 out of 52, which reduces to three out of 13. So all of the work again will be on its corresponding slide here. That is the addition rule for disjoint events. Next, we're gonna move into the general addition rule. So we're still working with or questions, we're still working with addition, but there's a difference here. What happens now is this Venn diagram, the two circles overlap. This area here is circle E. This circle is circle F. The overlap here is region E and F. So what E and F have in common? To find the probability of E or F, I need this one, this one, and this one all put together. So in this case, we could count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight numbers are within the circles out of our 10 numbers to get four out of five. The 
the probability of E or F is not the probability of E plus the probability of F. Here's why. E circle has the numbers five, seven, nine, one, and three. It has five numbers. F circle also has five numbers, zero, one, two, three, and four. I cannot just add the probability of E and F because this does not give me the same answer as I got up here, okay? This is because of this overlap here. I have counted the values of one and three twice. So in order to calculate a general addition rule, you are going to take the first probability plus the second probability and then subtract the overlap. There are five values in E. There are five values in F but there are two of them in the overlap, two values that are counted twice or counted in both of them. And when you subtract that two, we now see that they do match. Okay, so you have to be very careful to determine, do I have overlap or not? Here's the rule. General addition rule for probability of any two events E and F. You can find the probability of E or F by adding the individual probabilities and subtracting their overlap. Here's what we're going to do now. I'm going to show you a hard example where we do not have disjoint. Suppose a single card is selected from a 52 card deck. Compute the probability of the event drawing a king. Well, drawing a king, we knew that as four out of 52, or drawing a diamond. Okay, so let's see how you would do this. The probability of E or F is the probability of E plus the probability of F minus the overlap. So the probability of king or diamond is the probability of king plus the probability of diamond minus the probability of picking the king of diamond. We know we have four kings out of the deck. Now, I know we didn't do this one yet, but if we were to pull up an image of the deck of cards, you would see that there are four suits, spades, hearts, clubs, and diamonds. Four suits, each one having 13. So there are 13 clubs, 13 hearts, 13 spades, and 13 diamonds. So that is where this value comes from. And then there is one card that is the king of diamonds, which I'm going to take out. I should end up with 16 out of 52 or 4 out of 13. Okay, so I'm going to go back to that slide here just so you can see it. So king or diamonds. what happens. Here's the kings. And here's the diamonds. This is your overlap is the king of diamonds. So if I just count them individually, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I can count them that way. Okay but there are 13 diamonds, four kings with 17. I have to subtract the one king of diamonds to get my 16 out of 52 because this card was counted in both the diamonds and the kings. It was double counted. I know some of these are gonna take a lot of practice for some of you, but keep practicing, keep working. You can do these. All right. So the next thing we're going to do is work with what is called a contingency table or a two-way table. What we have here is we have two categories of data. In this case, the row is the marital status, and then a column is the gender. And then each box individually here is a cell. So we can talk about just males. We can talk about just females. 
We can talk about total, never married, married, widowed, whatever. We can talk about all those kinds of things. This is what we said, a two-way table because we have both columns and rows of information. We're going to determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years or older is male. Determine the probability that they are widowed. Determine the probability that any U.S. resident is widowed or divorced. And then determine the probability that a random selected person is male or widowed. So we've got a lot of different questions we're going to ask here. I'll do each one individually again. But before we can do that, we need to combine all of these things here. So we're going to first add the entries in each column. So we want to have the total number of males. So we do 46 plus 63.3 plus 3.3, 12.1, and 2.2. My total males is 126.9 million. I can then do this column here. So if we do females... 40.1, 62, 11.9, 16.1, and 3.1, 133.2, because I want to have my total down here. So if I add those two together, my total that I'm working with is 260.1 million. Okay, so I will always pick the columns, because there's less columns here for me to add. But I may also need the, the totals this way as well. So I could add the totals this way. 46.0 and 40.1 is 86.1. I'm just going to have these values here. 63.3 plus 62. Oops, 63.3 plus 62. 125.3, 3.3 plus 11.9, So I like to have my totals because it helps me. I'm working with uh, figuring out these probabilities. So I will always go and get the total columns if they did not give them to me. Total for columns and total for rows, as well as overall total, because I'm going to need that overall total when I'm doing my probabilities. The first question was, determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident 15 years or old is a male. We take how many males we have out of how many total. So 126.9 out of 260.1 is going to get me that first answer for A. We have roughly 48.8% are male. Question B, determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident is widowed. If I go to widowed, my total is 15.2 out of my 260.1. Here, if I were to think about this, this is about 5.8% are widowed. And this is of all U.S. residents. Okay. Question C asked us to determine the probability that a randomly selected U.S. resident is widowed or divorced. So if we look back at the table here, widow and divorced are completely separate options. You cannot be widowed here. You're, if you're counted as widowed, you are not counted as divorced. They are separate values. So these are disjoint, meaning I'm just going to add the values together. And the 15.2 and the 28.2. 15.2 plus 
gives me a total of 43.4 out of my original total of 260.1. Notice when you add fractions together here, the only thing that is changing is your numerator. Your denominator does not change when you are adding these together. Last one, asked us, and the probability that we select a male or widowed. If we look back at the table, these events are not mutually exclusive because there are 3.3 million males who are widowed. So if I go back to the table here, I'll show you visually. Males and widowed. Okay, when I pick a column and a row and do an or question, there is overlap, okay? When I pick two rows, there was no overlap. They do not cross over each other, but a row and a column do overlap. So what I have to do is I have to account for that. I have 126.9 males, 15.2 widow, and this 3.3 .3 is counted twice. So I have to use the disjoint. I wish there was a faster way to get there. Probability of male plus probability of widowed minus the male widows. That was 126.9 million males, 15.2 million widowed, and 33 males that were widowed. 3.3, .3, sorry, males that were widowed. So again, I'm just summing these two subtracting the 3.3 .3 to get my numerator of 138.8. .8. So the probability I would select a male or anyone who is widowed would be about 534 or about 53.4%. Last thing we're going to do is go on to the complements and at least. Let us denote the sample space of a probability experiment and let E denote some event. The complement of E is then denoted E to the superscript C. Anytime we put the, the thing above up and to the right, that's a superscript. When it was down and below, like E sub one, that's a subscript. That's why I say E sub one. So E superscript C is the complement of E. And what it represents is it wants all the other values. So if I know what E is and its probability, E's complement is all the values that are not in E. Just a little quick little thing here. If I know the probability of E occurring is 0.30 or 30% 30 of the time event E occurs. Well, then E's complement, E does not happen 70% of the time. So if E happens 30% of the time, E does not happen 70% of the time. That is what E complement means. Just the remaining value. So the way you do that, if E represents any event, the probability of E complement is 1 minus the probability of E. And that makes perfect sense. One minus 0.30 is 0.70 on my little example that I just did on the previous page. If E represents any, again, here, here is E. The box is the, enti uh, the entire region. If this is E, what is outside of E is considered E is complement. Visual form if you're more of a visual person. According to the National Gambling Impact Study Commission, 52% of Americans have played state lotteries. What is the probability that a randomly selected American has not played a state lottery? Okay, so two ways you can think about this. Full is 100% minus 52% is going to give me 48%. Or you use the complement form. P 
of E complement is one minus, I need to change 52% into decimal form. So 52% means 52 out of 100, which is 0.52. One minus 0.52 is 0.48, which is the same as 48%. So it's just preference as to how you want to think about it. If they give it to me in percent form, you can just take it away from 100%. If they give it to you in decimal point form, you can subtract it from one. I just wanted to show you that it works both ways. That one whole is also 100%. Here we have a table which is the income distribution of households in the United States in the year 2017. So how many thousands of people were in each of these different income brackets? Compute the probability that a randomly selected household earned the following income. So $200,000 or more. Well, the first thing we have to do, oops, sorry, before we can do this is add all of these together to get my total. Okay, so I've already done that for you, and the entire total is 120,063. And then that's in thousands, so it's technically more than that, just so you know. So we want to know how many are $200,000 or more. So this value out of this value. So 82, 84 out of 120,063 gives us a probability of 0 0.069. Because it is three decimals, I would put that as 69 out of 1,000. So if I look at 1,000 households, about 69 of them would be above $200,000 in income. Find the probability I get less than 200,000. So there's two choices here. I could add this one, 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 which is going to take me a lot of time. Or I work with my complement. This is the only one I don't want now. So wouldn't it be easier to just subtract from one what we already have? If 0 0.069 is $200,000 or more, and we want less than that, well, then that's everything else because it's everything else on the table. So one minus that value is 0.931. So complement is used when... You have you combine the one and then you don't want that one. This is about 931 out of a thousand. We would have less than that two hundred thousand dollar value. Last question is probability we get at least a hundred ten thousand dollars. Okay, what does at least mean? Well, the phrase at least means greater than or equal to. So we want the probability that what I select is greater than or equal to 10,000. Again, if I go to that table, now I want any value bigger than 10,000. Well, that's this, 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 this. So I can either add all of them together or I can just subtract the one I don't have. To me, it's shorter to subtract the one I don't have than it is to add all of those values together. It makes more sense for me to take one minus the one I don't want than it is to add all of those individual fractions together. And again, that is a complement value. And again, we can explain what that means. 0.935 would be 935 out of 1,000. So if I were to sample 1,000 people, we would expect about 935 of them to be earning more than that $10,000.
So I just have a few um, added examples. I always like to do some extra examples at the end to kind of recap what we did in this section. So remember, addition of disjoint, general addition, and then our complements. So we'll probably have one of each. All right, so leave it as a rule for disjoint events, as it clearly states here. The probability model shows the distribution of number of rooms in a housing unit in the United States. So one room, two room, three, all the way up to nine or more rooms, and we have the probability of them occurring. All right, so verify that this is a probability model. So the first thing I do is I check that all of these numbers are between zero and one. That is rule one is good. Rule two means I'm going to add all of these together. I will allow you to do that if you want to pause here, you want to add them all together. Um, but I promise if you do add them all together, it does work. The sum is one. What is the probability a randomly selected housing unit has two or three rooms? Okay, well, here's two, here's three. So they are totally separate values. All I have to do is add them together. Other. And if I add those two together, I get 0.125. What is the probability a randomly selected housing unit has one or two or three? So one or two or three, adding all of those together is now 0.135. I remember if it wants to interpret that, this will be 125 out of 1,000, 135 out of 1,000. So we have a two-way table. Anytime we have a two-way table, we may have a potential for overlap. All right. So to do this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make my totals or my columns as well as my rows. So what is the probability that a randomly selected person is employed? My total employed over here is 48.37 out of 17.042. So this is my grand total that all of these are going to be um, representative of. So you could keep that as a fraction or you could do the division. If you did the division, 0.284 is what you would get. So about 28.4% of these people were employed. What's the probability of randomly selected person is a male? So males, we had 8,642 out of that 17,042. And if you were to do that division, 0. 0.507 is what you would get. So then the next question is an or question. What is the probability that a randomly selected person is employed for male? So here's the problem. We found employed above is 48.37 out of 17.042. We found males as 86.42 out of 17.042. Here's the problem. We have an overlap of employed males that we need to subtract. <laughs> All I'm going to do is in my calculator, 4,837 plus 8,642 minus 2,328. And that is going to give me 11,151 out of my 17,042. And if I do that division, I would get 0.65. Okay, so one more question here. The data to the right represents the travel time to work for residents of Hartford County. 
What is the probability a randomly selected resident has travel time of 90 or more minutes? Okay, so the first thing we need to do would be to sum all of these values together. So I already did that for you. 393,186, that is my total. The probability I pick 90 or more minutes, that's this guy, 4,895 out of 393,186. Okay, so I just go to a calculator, I type that in, I'm going to get 0 0.012. Okay, just in case you guys really want to see me do one of these. Okay, so 4895 divided by 393168, 0.012. So B says compute the probability that a randomly selected resident of Hartford County will have a commute less than 90 minutes. So that's all the other ones. Do I wanna add up all the other ones? No, I'm gonna subtract my result from one, figure out how much is left. So if 0.012 have a travel time of 90 or more, the remaining 0.988 do not. Oops, nine, eight, eight. There we go. That is section two. We have one more section for this week, which is section five, three, and I will see you there.